We've now studied Brownian motion and its path properties from the perspective of a continuous stochastic process. In order to develop more intricate properties of Brownian paths, we're going to need to use its realization as a Markov process or a martingale. To go down that road, we're going to need to develop further the tools associated to those kinds of stochastic processes in the continuous time setting. And so we turn now to discuss continuous time stopping times. Now, before we do that, we have to struggle with one important measurability issue. When we talked about evaluating a discrete time stochastic process at a random time, there was really no issue. We had our stochastic process Xn, that was a sequence of random variables all defined on the same probability space, taking values in the same state space, and then some natural number valued random variable on that same probability space. It was then quite straightforward to compose the two. X tau is a new random variable whose value at an outcome omega was just X at tau of omega, whatever omega is, that's some particular Xn evaluated at omega. And it was a basic question on an early assignment in this class to show that that is a new measurable random variable, measurable with respect to the same sigma fields that we have around. In fact, one way to view the measurability of that random variable is just to note that it is a composition of this map with tau. This views xn of omega as a function of two variables, n and omega, and it is straightforward to check that this is measurable in both variables on the product sigma field, simply because the sigma field on the discrete set of natural numbers is going to be the full sigma field of all subsets. And then we can evaluate x tau as the composition of phi with tau times the identity map, which is a composition of measurable maps. Now, this automatic measurability when you compose a stochastic process with a random time does not work that way and does not always hold in the continuous time setting. Let's look at an example. Consider the following real-valued stochastic process on the positive real line. We fix some subset of the positive real line and we define xt to be constant, independent of omega, equal to just the indicator of that set at t. That is to say, xt is 0 or 1 valued. It takes the value 1 if t is in A and 0 if t is not in A. Now, what A should we use? Well, let's fix some subset of the positive real line that is not a Borel set. We certainly know such sets exist. Now, the random variable xt is not really a random variable, it is just a constant. For each t, it's either 0 or 1. So it's certainly measurable. But if we look at this function of two variables here, x of t and omega, which again doesn't depend on omega, it's just this, this is not measurable in the way we had this function measurable up here. Indeed, if we look at the set of all t and omega, for which phi of t and omega is equal to 1, that's exactly equal to a times the universe omega, and that is not in here. Now this looks like a pretty unnatural pathological example, but in fact it's emblematic of what can happen, and as we'll see shortly, things can get even hairier if we have a filtration around and are trying to be adapted as well. The TLDR is we cannot assume that we can evaluate a process xt at a random time t and get a measurable map out. We need some additional assumptions for that to be true. Here is the standard assumption that we will use and show holds in all the cases that we care about. Given a filtered probability space and a stochastic process on that filtered probability space, it is called progressively measurable, or sometimes just progressive, if for every finite time t, if you look at that map from the time interval times the probability space into the state space, restricted to the interval up to t, which is just viewing the process xt of omega as a function of two variables, that map 
is jointly measurable. And in fact, it's jointly measurable on the Borel sigma field over the time interval from zero up to t, product with the sigma field ft of the process up to time t. This is stronger than what we showed a counterexample to on the last slide, which would have been the case where we let t go to infinity here and this just be the larger sigma field for the whole probability space. In fact, in a certain sense, this stronger assumption is that plus adaptedness of the process. And that's our first lemma. Let's define phi to be the function xt of omega viewed as a function of time and omega separately for all positive time, so that our map phi t here is the restriction of that map to the interval from zero up to t cross omega. If we have a process that is progressively measurable, according to this definition, then it is an adapted process, adapted to the filtration at hand. And this map phi is jointly measurable on the full product sigma field for all time. This is very simple to prove. We just have to sort of put the pieces together. Let's define eta t to be a random variable which basically takes values in the probability space, but product with the singleton point t. Well, we can view that as taking values in the interval from zero up to t times omega. Then it is a straightforward calculation that I'll leave to you that this map, eta t, is always measurable from ft into the Borel sigma field on the interval from zero up to t product with the overall sigma field for the probability space. But then we can get our process x at time capital T at the end just by composing that eta t with phi t. And our assumption was that the process is progressively measurable, which means that phi is measurable from here to here. And since eta is measurable from ft to here, it follows that the composition is measurable from ft into b, which is exactly to say that x is adapted. So progressive measurability implies adaptedness. And now we want to see that this restricted notion for each finite t gives us measurability of this joint function of t and omega on the full time interval. Well, fix any measurable subset of the state space, V, and look at the preimage under the joint map phi of V intersected with the time interval from zero up to t cross omega. By definition, that's just phi t preimage of V, since phi t is the restriction of phi to that set. But since the process is progressively measurable, that's an element of the sigma field Borel of zero up to t product with ft, which is of course contained in the Borel sigma field on the whole positive line crossed with f. Here we're using the usual realization of this time interval as a subset of this one. And since it's a closed subset, therefore this Borel sigma field is contained in that one. Now we just note that we can decompose the full positive real line as the countable union over those t's in the natural numbers of the interval from 0 up to t. It's of course not a disjoint union, but we don't need it to be. And therefore, the preimage of phi on the whole set v, not just intersected like this, is therefore the union over all those natural number t's of the preimage under phi of v intersected with that time interval. But we just showed that each element in this union is in the Borel sigma field over the whole line, product with f, and this is a countable union. Therefore, this is also in that larger sigma field. And that shows exactly what we wanted to show, that phi is indeed measurable with respect to this sigma field taking values in b. Now, the counterexample we gave in the last slide certainly didn't have any of this nice adaptedness structure here. We've seen that progressive measurability implies adaptedness. Perhaps the converse is also true. Maybe any adapted process is automatically progressively measurable, or at least measurable in this weaker sense, so that we can compose with a random time and get a measurable map. Well, it turns out that that's not true. Progressive measurability is strictly stronger than adaptedness, although I'm not going to take the time to go through a counterexample now, it'll be instructive for you to try to 
find one in the literature. But fortunately, that's not going to be a problem for all of the processes we care about. This pathology does not occur in right continuous path processes, which include all of the ones that we've thought about in this course. So here's the proposition. Suppose that S is a separable metric space. Again, you can just think of RD, for example, and let X be an S-valued stochastic process defined on a filtered probability space. If that process is adapted and has right continuous paths, almost surely, then it is, in fact, progressively measurable. And so all of these measurability issues won't bother us. The idea of the proof here is to approximate the process X by one that is piecewise constant. It'll be easy to show that those approximating processes are progressively measurable, and then the robustness of measurability and the limits will get the result that we need. Here are the details. For each finite time capital T, we will approximate the two variable function phi of t and omega, that is xt of omega, by subdividing the interval into equal length subintervals and approximating the function to be piecewise constant equal to the value at the right endpoint in each case. Now for convenience, we'll actually let phi n denote the subdivided into two to the n intervals of the same length. And so if we want a formula, this will be the sum k ranging from one up to two to the n of the process x value at kt over two to the n on the interval k minus one t over two to the n up to kt over two to the n. Then it's an elementary matter to show that as n goes to infinity, phi n converges to phi on the interval from zero up to t, point-wise. Now this might look strange since the function phi n has paths that are assumed to be right continuous and we're approximating it by left continuous paths. But if you work with this just a little bit, you'll see that that's actually what's necessary so that in the approximation, we're always approaching from the right when we take the limit. If you find this confusing, since we're mostly interested in continuous path processes, it really won't matter whether we take the left or the right endpoint or whatever we do here. For continuous paths, the continuity of the process and the fact that these intervals are shrinking in size will be enough to show that phi n converges to phi t for continuous paths. But I do urge that you figure out why this is the right way to approximate a right continuous path process with left continuous piecewise constant pieces. Now with that in hand, for any measurable subset of the state space, V, if we look at the preimage under phi n, this approximation of V, what we get is, well, because we've done this right approximation, we haven't necessarily included zero. And so we will have to separate out that we get the singleton point zero times the preimage of the process x at time zero under v union with the union of those pieces of the interval from k minus one t over two to the n up to kt over two to the n times the preimage of the process at the right endpoint. But the process was assumed to be adapted, which means that this is in the filtration at time kt over 2 to the n. And so this product here is in the Borel sigma field of the interval from 0 up to kt over 2 to the n, product with the sigma field at time kt over 2 to the n. And since k is less than or equal to 2 to the n, that's contained in the Borel sigma field from zero up to t, product with the sigma field at time t. So that shows us, by definition, that phi n is measurable from that set to b, and therefore, by the robustness of limits, the limit of the phi n's, which is phi t, is also so measurable. But measurability of phi t between these sigma fields for each t is the definition of progressive measurability, and so that proves the result.
that means that it's going to make sense to compose x with a random time tau if that random time is measurable enough. And in fact, progressive measurability is designed specifically to fit with stopping times. So our next stop is continuous time stopping times.